Okay, hello everybody. This is my, I think, fifth time speaking here at the university in the last three years. And I wanted to change it a little bit. I've presented in the past with regard to the sensor technology, and I'm going to talk about it today again. But I want to put a twist on it. Not only do I want to tell you about the company and where it's headed, but I want all of you today to be investors or considering to be investors. So what I want you to do is pretend that you have $10 million US dollars, not drum, 10 million US dollars sitting in the bank and you want to invest it. And I'm one of the people coming in with a presentation to you about this technology and I'm going to be asking you for investment funding. So what I want you to do is not only try to understand the technology a little bit and understand what's happening here in Armenia with respect to that technology, but I want you to consider this presentation in terms of you being a multi-millionaire and you want to make an investment and you're trying to decide whether this presentation is worthy of an investment. Now I have a little surprise for you. I know that there's some flaws in this presentation. I'm not going to tell you what they are. So I'm hoping as you watch it, you'll come up with the flaws and you'll try to ask me questions about areas where you think the presentation is weak. Okay? So it'll be, we'll try to make it a little bit fun here in addition to just the presentation. Okay, Global Innovations Incorporated is a small startup company in Los Angeles and we're representing an Armenian technology company here in Yerevan. And that company's name is Precision Sensors Instrumentation Limited. It's based in, at Yerevan State University. It's in the physics department. It is a sensor technology that senses seismic vibrations in the ground. And as a result, you can uh, detect footsteps or you can detect tru uh, trucks or cars you can detect tanks coming in, and as a result, there is quite a bit of interest in this technology, uh, especially here in Armenia and for Artsakh, for the border with Azerbaijan. If you can sense soldiers, uh, Azeri soldiers or Azeri tanks or Azeri trucks attacking the Armenian or Artsakh border, if you can detect that ahead of time, that's a big deal for the generals. So we are uh, actively involved with the government and with the military here in Armenia trying to get interest in this new technology that was invented here at the University at Yerevan at the Ghana All right, now as I go along, not only am I going to give you the presentation, but I want to explain to you why we're giving, why the presentation was created this way, because another thing that I'd like to uh, be able to have you learn today is how to give, how to write, and how to present an investment presentation, or an investment request presentation. So the first thing you want to do is create a burning platform. Like, what is the reason I'm here? Why do we have this startup company? Why are we interested in getting investment funds? So we have two burning platforms. One of them is what I just told you about. Armenia's border with uh, Azerbaijan is vulnerable to attack. And the second is, the uh, second burning platform is the U.S.-Mexico border. There's a lot of uh, illegal drugs and illegal people coming in from Mexico. They're bringing in weapons. Now, right now, it's just small weapons like handguns and submachine guns. But it could very easily be biological weapons. It could very easily be uh, a, a dirty bomb. You, you know what a dirty bomb is? Bring in uranium products that could be used for... Uh, either a nuclear explosion or just uh, spread uh, radiation throughout the country. So these are issues. And now we're finding out that for the U.S.-Mexico border, there's tunnels being dug more than 30 feet deep and over one or two kilometers long, and they're bringing in illegal weapons and drugs and etc. through the tunnels. So there's got to be a way of sensing all that so that the border security on the United States side can detect these uh, tunnels being dug and then stop it. So these are the two burning platforms that I'm going to present today to you as investors. 
Now, for Armenia, it's uh, pretty serious. Uh, Azerbaijan is outspending Armenia by three to one at least for military uh, equipment. Azerbaijan has three to five times as many troops, tanks, artillery, aircraft. And of course, you all know that the Azeri president has made a lot of threats about regaining Artsakh uh, back by force. And of course, we all also know that there's a lot of sniper attacks and there's uh, one or two people, either civilians or Armenian soldiers, being killed uh, every month. So there's probably about 20 a year being killed on average. So the security of Armenia and Artsakh's border with Azerbaijan is at stake. So, so that's the burning platform in terms of Armenia and Artsakh and why this censor would be important. Okay, well we already talked about the first bullet here. The, the Armenian border force is scattered thin along the border. Now, we'll talk more about how this censor would help in solving that problem too. And of course, an early warning system. We want to have the, uh, the sensor system provide early warning. Same with the U.S. national border with Mexico. A lot of illegal drugs coming in. We've talked about that. A lot of sophisticated tunnels. And what we found out is they, they're bringing in Palestinian civil engineers who build tunnels from Palestine and into Israel and, and and the issues that are going on there, and they're bringing that expertise to Mexico. And because the drug cartels in Mexico are so wealthy, they can easily afford to bring in any kind of technical expertise they want to have their tunnels dug properly. So here's the second burning platform in a little more detail. Uh, and this is the second burning platform. Now, for the U.S.-Mexico border, Boeing was awarded a $2.53 billion contract in 2007 to build a border fence. And that fence included towers, it included an actual fence that we're normally used to. It also included thermal imaging sensors which, sen which senses heat and can see at night. Uh, light amplification systems so they can see at night. And also ground sensors. But the seismic sensors they're using in the ground now only work out to about 30 meters so it doesn't give them a whole lot of advanced warning. The system turned out to be a disaster because it was not system engineered properly and it wasn't managed properly. So in 2011, the U.S. Homeland Security Department canceled the program with Boeing after, after Boeing had spent $1 billion to build only about 100 kilometers of the, of the border security fence. So it turned out they terminated the contract uh, a couple of years passed, the engineers working for the U.S. government were trying to go back and figure out what went wrong and how do you go back and fix it. So now the U.S. government is asking American industry to come forward with uh, proposals in October 2013 and see what we can come up with in terms of building a border fence that actually works properly at a reasonable price. So that's, that's where the big market is right now. Now, U.S. Homeland Security currently has no method for, for uh, detecting deep tunnels. So that's a real issue and a real weakness with the current 100 kilometers of border fence. Now, it turns out that the, the whole border with Mexico is about 3,200 kilometers. So only about 3% of the total border is actually, being, uh, is actually completed now. And, of course, that doesn't work very well. And that's part of the failure that Boeing went through. Okay, as a result of these concerns, there's false alarms. There was uh, two border security agents were in the dark in September of last year, and they accidentally shot each other, and one was killed, the other was wounded. So it's a very serious problem for the U.S. border with Mexico. So here's our vision of global innovations. And of course, we're representing precision sensors and instrumentation here in the other one. Uh, sorry, I didn't get the point. Uh, why the two uh, border agents uh, shoot each other? Because they were out in the dark in the middle of the desert. They didn't realize that they were both on the same side. So they thought that each of them thought the other one was an illegal alien coming across the border, either with drugs or weapons. 
Uh, because of the sensor systems they're using now, they don't get complete information. So when they go out there in the dark in the middle of nowhere, they're kind of guessing. And somebody, one of the agents shot the other, and then, then they ended up shooting each other. So it was by accident, unfortunately. One was killed, one was wounded. Okay, so our vision at Global uh, Innovations is to create a highly reliable border security system. And we want to be able to automatically detect and specify intruders of any kind, on the ground or in tunnels. That's the whole idea behind this company, this technology, and, and why we're here today uh, looking for investors. So the solution is we want to introduce Armenia's cutting-edge sensor technology. And of course, I've mentioned earlier, GII is the U.S. marketing arm and the uh, uh, systems engineering arm of the company. And PSI is the company here that invented the sensor here at Yerevan State University. And it's now a separate company that is incubating at the company. And have, have they been taught about incubation? Okay. So, <clears throat> so the, the, the PSI has approval um, and the cooperation of Yerevan State University to continue working at the university in the hopes that the company will become a big company, a profitable company, and something of, that can be a great a source of income for the country and a source of pride for the country. So that's, that's the reason why Yerevan State University is allowing the company to remain within the university for the time being. All right, well, I already talked a little about GII, Global Innovations. Now, GII, I, I'm one of the American Armenians uh, working in GII in Los Angeles. We have two others. We are all from the aerospace industry in America, so we know what's going on in terms of the big Boeing contract that was terminated by uh, Homeland Security. We're uh, confident and capable of running a company within Los Angeles and moving forward and working with the U.S. government in the event that we were to win a contract. And of course, because we have our contacts here at PSI, at Yerevan State University, working with the PSI and further developing the technology here is something that we're, we've been doing and we feel that's a, it's a seamless uh, working relationship. Okay, now PSI, um, Dr. Sambel Gevorgyan, who is the inventor of the sensor, is a PhD physicist at Yerevan State University, he's one of the professors there, and he invented the seismic sensor technology as a result of the, well in 1988 we had the bad earthquake here in Hayastan, and so he was working on different technologies at that time and he realized that the technologies he was working on could be applied to developing a seismic sensor technology. As a result, uh, we American Armenians got involved with Dr. Gevorgyan and we uh, realized that not only could it be a seismic sensor technology or something that would sense earthquakes, but it would be also very valuable for border security. And since border security has a much, much bigger market than um, uh, earthquake sensing, we decided that our first push would be towards that, towards, you know, selling this, marketing this technology for earthquakes, for a border sensor. Okay. And of course here at the bottom there's five PhDs at the university working at PSI on this technology and five other managers. So right now there's just ten people here in, in PSI at the company. Alright, so I wanted to show you now a little bit about the technology, the early warning border security system. So this would be how, how do you implement the system and how do you go, what are the applications? Alright, this is an actual photo of illegals crossing the border from Mexico into the United States. And here would be what we would propose as a system for the U.S. You have each of the sensors would be placed in the ground, and the green circles are showing you the, the area that each sensor can sense. And right now we're looking at an area where the radius would be about 300 meters 
out or a diameter of 600 meters for each of these circles. So 300 meters is about 10 times further than the current technology that's being used uh, at the border. So this is a huge improvement. The best technology in the world prior to PSI's technology is about 30 meters for sensing somebody walking. Now for trucks and tanks, the, the distance is further, but right now we'll just talk about the, the distance for walking. So. We're talking about increasing that 30 meter radius to 300 meters and even perhaps more than that. So if you were to have these sensors along the border and then the sensors would be buried in the ground about 20 or 30 centimeters. So it's a quick hurry up, dig a little hole, put it in. The sensor will be about the size of my fist, covered up with dirt. And in fact, what we're going to bury in the dirt is we're going to make it look like a rock. So. When we bury it in the dirt, it'll look like a rock. It'll be gone. No, it'll leave, no one will even know it's there. Uh, it'll be talking to uh, stations further back from the border. And then from there, it will transmit back to uh, where, wherever the headquarters would be for border security. So as, as someone is either digging or uh, coming towards the border fence, There'll be at least a 300 meter uh, notification distance here, and then that informa information will go to the border security headquarters, and then they'll send border agents out there to uh, intercept them. Any questions at this point? Uh, all the sens uh, sensors are working. For example, is there any uh, battery issues? Okay, that's a good they're question. Working. Good. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. That was that was one of the things uh, we deliberately left. Uh, I deliberately left out to see if you would catch that or not. So you know, I'm, I got caught on the first one. Very good. Uh, the, the, actually, it could be uh, either way. The current systems that are used that are that are only good for 30 meters, they have batteries in them, and they have to be replaced every three months. So four times a year, somebody's got to go out in the field, and they've got to dig. They got to know where that sensor was, and they got to dig that hole and pull that thing out, and then open it up and put a new battery in four times a year. Now, believe it or not, this is what's being done at the border now with Armenia and Azerbaijan. The Armenian soldiers have to go out there at night, hope they don't get shot at by snipers, and they have to replace the batteries. That is a big problem, and the solution is don't use batteries. The solution is bury a wire out there. If you're gonna if you're gonna bury the the sensor, you may as well bury a wire. If you bury a wire, you eliminate your battery problem. And since at the border, that's a that's an issue in terms of soldiers getting killed. Uh, it's a big advantage if you're not using a battery. How do you detect the cutting of the three wires? I don't know. How I can detect uh, if some people cut the uh, wires? You won't get oh, signal. how do you? Oh, well, you won't get a signal. I mean, that, so and there's ways of pulsing. You can send a signal to check to see if it's uh, functional or not. Uh, and also, how I see if there is a person walking or some animals? Okay, that's a good question too. And that was you caught me on the second one because that's <laughs> you're doing good. <laughs> All right. Uh, it turns out that each type of movement is different. Just like earthquakes have different signatures, a person walking on two feet has a different noise signature as compared to someone who's running, or a four-legged animal, or a truck, or a tank, or a car. A tank has an extremely different noise signature, vibration signature, uh, than a car or somebody walking. So you can detect these things. But the enemy should learn how to walk like a sheep. Yes. Well, <laughs> that's true. Except for four-legged people, as is that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Except as soon as you as soon as you know that they're doing that, then you can you can just add that into your software, and as soon as you see that uh, signature, you know it's them pretending they're sheep. Okay. So so there's a way around all those things. Yeah. I mean, they could do they could change. You know, obviously they're not going to try to walk like sheep, but they could perhaps um, maybe use ski equipment 
because then their impact would be different. However, it would also be very unwieldy for, for attacking troops on ground, on land, to come in with skis on. But yeah, if they try to do those things, as soon as uh, the Armenian forces learn that they're trying to do those things, then that can be accommodated in the software. Okay, very good. You got, you got two of my flaws. Okay. So, so I know somebody's listening. <laughs> Okay, well, we talked about this. Um, uh, if you can sense out to two or three hundred meters on the ground, you can certainly sense that far or deeper in terms of finding a tunnel. Uh, the U.S. government is now looking for sensors that can sense out to something like 30 meters deep, at least, and more. Because they know that these tunnels are being dug by these drug cartels, and since the drug cartels have billions of dollars available, they can dig as deep as they want if they knew that they could avoid detection. All right, but here's some other security applications. It doesn't have to be at the border. It doesn't have to be at the U.S.-Mexico border. It doesn't have to be the border with Azerbaijan. It could be any of these places. It could be a nuclear power plant that has water surrounding it, because our sensor actually works better in water, because water is homogeneous, far more so than, than land. And of course, it could be a border. It could be one of our ancient monasteries here in Hayastan that maybe you want to protect it. Uh, it could be a, an airstrip on the far bottom left, or it could be a, a nuclear power plant that's completely surrounded by land rather than water. Or it can be a government building. We know this. Okay, now the side-by-side -side fields, and then I've already said this earlier, uh, we've, we've taken a, an American-made sensor that has a 30-meter sensing distance, and we've gone out outside of Yerevan, out in the fields. In fact, I was out there uh, Sunday. We're out in the field, and we're, we are certain that the Armenian design and the Armenian invented sensor is at least 10 times better than the best sensors in the world, including the American-made sensor. So we've been out several different places. We've been to the Armenian military range uh, last spring, and we were in uh, Singapore in 2010 doing humidity, you know, working in an area of high humidity uh, to see if there's any differences. So this, this system is far superior to what's currently being sold on the market. So here's our business plan and marketing strategy. Now before I go further, I have to take out the real numbers because this is being a videotaped for YouTube and we don't want our competitors to see it. So the numbers that you see in terms of the dollars are all fake. Uh, I've changed the dates, so those are fake. But I want you to be able to see how you would create the slides and how you would make the presentation to investors. So uh, even though the numbers are fake, this, the formatting and the presentation approach is what you should learn from. Okay, so I told you earlier that GII is the U.S. arm, the American arm of the technology company PSI that's located here in Yerevan. So what we're doing is we're looking, at this point, we're just looking for uh, enough investment money so we can continue from taking the current sensor technology, which is a field-tested uh, prototype. It's a field-tested prototype at this point. And we want to take that to a, to a redesign. We want to redesign the sensor so that it is production-ready. And of course, a prototype is not production ready, but it is field tested, and we field tested it. Actually, we field tested it more than the three times that I've shown you in the slide. Um, so we're confident that it works, and now we're confident that if we go through a redesign phase where we design it so that it's easy to build and it's rugged, so it can withstand being out in the out, out in, a, in the environment. So we will be doing a lot of environmental testing. That's, the, that's where we're looking for investment money, to take it from field test to prototype to production ready hardware. Now right now 
now we're also looking for business. And we're, we're not just looking for investors. We're also looking for actual business, either with uh, different governments, whether it's Armenian government, Armenian military, U.S. government for the border fence with Mexico. And there's other countries that have shown interest. We've gotten phone calls from Norway. Uh, it sounded like there was interest in Finland. We know there's interest in the Dominican Republic because it turns out Haitians are leaving Haiti and coming across the border from Haiti into the Dominican Republic. So the, the government of Dominican is also interested in the technology. And of course, you all know that there's a lot of problems going on in the Middle East. So Jordan has border problems, uh, Syria, Iraq, on and on. There's a lot of issues in the Middle East. So there's a lot of areas where there could be companies interested in this technology. And as we go around and we talk to people, we found out that there's other uh, markets for it that we never even imagined. And one of them, believe it or not, is protecting cell phone towers. When you have a cell phone tower in a very remote part of, of any country, not just Armenia, but any country, people go out there and steal the electronics from the cell phone tower. So you can't have somebody protecting every cell phone tower in all the remote locations that a cell phone company would put a cell phone tower. So the cell phone companies have expressed interest because of the issues of damage and theft to remote cell phone towers. Uh, we're also looking into uh, providing sensor technology for uh, neighborhoods, for just for residential neighborhoods. If you have an area where you want to protect two or three hundred homes, you can do that by setting up a handful of these sensors and being able to sense intruders to an area that you want to protect. So these are these are um, potential businesses that we could get into. Uh, we've, we've, we're trying to make arrangements now to win business from these different types of either government organizations or private companies. Uh, we're looking to win a couple of uh, contracts, small contracts, this year. So that'll help with our uh, funding of the company and for us to be able to grow. And then we're, we're looking forward to 2014 and 2015 where the contracts will start getting bigger in size. And also we hope eventually to hit a production contract. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking for investment funding now to take our prototype to production ready because we are looking for production contracts in 2014 and 2015, and we want to be ready for that. Now, uh, the United States Homeland Security is, is going to be accepting proposals from United States Ameri or American companies, uh, from American companies to provide a proposal on how they intend on building the border fence. So there's probably going to be at least 10 major proposals from different American companies proposing technologies to the Homeland Security on, as to how to build this border fence. And it is our intent to become, to become a supplier of the sensor technology to whatever, whichever company wins the contract from the government. Now obviously, it's going to be a big American company that wins this contract because this is a big job building 3,200 kilometers of border fence. We want to be the small sensor company providing the sensors that are going to be used as part of that border fence. And this is big business. Uh, we're anticipating which, whatever big company wins the border security contract, it's probably going to be on the order of three to five billion dollars. The size of the contract for the sensors to whoever wins the sensor contract will probably be on the order of a hundred million dollars. So if, if GII and PSI were to be chosen as the sensor company for the border fence, there's potential for a hundred million dollars in business. And that would be scattered out from 2016, I think it is, to 2024. So it'll be over an eight-year period. Now, I, as you can see, I took the numbers out because since this is going on YouTube, we don't want our competitors to see it. <laughs> but um, what I wanted you, what I want you to learn from this is how you're going to show your investors 
the, your anticipated growth of the company. So here, GII in 2013 is just a tiny little company. So an investor, if an investor invested 1%, uh, uh, and wanted to purchase 1% of the company, then that would be X number of dollars. As the company grows in size over the next five or 10 years, then that 1% grows in size. So if, if the company was, say, a million dollars now and it grew to a hundred million, and if you own one percent now, and if the company grew to a hundred million, and if you owned one percent of a hundred million, you would have a million dollars. So this is, this is the kind of uh, introductory slide that you should make when you're doing a presentation for an investor. But I want to emphasize these are not the actual figures, and of course I've taken out the numbers. Um, because of the issue of competition and proprietary information. Now, return on investment and valuation of the company. Uh, I, I, I was the one involved in trying to, to determine the value of the company now, and that's not an easy thing to do. So, when you look at how an accountant or a financial person would try to determine the value of a company. They look at your profits, they look at your sales, they have ratios, and they can calculate it. But what happens when your company doesn't have sales? You know, when your company is new, it's just starting. You don't have sales, you don't have profits. Then how do you determine the value of a company? So there, there's two ways, and one of them you're going to laugh. Uh, one of them is, it's, it's worth whatever you can get for it. It's just like when you go to Vernissage on a Saturday or Sunday and people have all their stuff you know, scattered out on the tables and everything's for sale. And, what's, and, and, and you know, a lot of the stuff is used or old. So what is the value of that stuff that they're selling? And it's basically whatever they can get for it. So there's a negotiation. If you, if you have a company and you don't have any sales, you don't have any profits, you don't have anything. You're just a new company, you've got a product that you know is good and you're trying to sell it. What you do is you try to convince the investor that this company has value and you establish some mutually agreeable dollar amount. And then from there you can say, okay, if the company is worth $100 million and you want to buy 50% of it, then you're going to have to put in $50 million. It's something like that. That's one way of doing it. Uh, but there's another way, and it's a little better than just negotiating some you know, unknown amount. What you do is you look at what is the business outlook for the company. How many contracts could be won in the near future? What are the size of those contracts? And what is the chance of our company winning those contracts? So if you look through all those uh, pieces of information and you create a chart and you can figure out where you think the company might be in terms of its value. So that's what we tried to do here. And we talked about that a little bit in this slide and then in the next slide. And of course I have to take out all, all the information about what who, who the customers are and their names. I've changed the, the numbers here so that it's not our numbers. But what I wanted to show you is, the first thing is, is your organization. Who, who might be your customer? So that would be customer company 1 through 13. And what is the application? Border security, homeland security. Um, we had a medical equipment one here where we talked to a medical equipment company. And this is an interesting application for medical technology. You want to be able to put a sensor on the back of your shoulder and sense uh, when you're breathing, the sensor can actually hear the difference between somebody who's breathing healthy and someone who is not breathing healthy. In other words, what is the conversion of, of the air you're breathing going into the bloodstream as oxygen? And so the sound of that is different for a healthy person versus a sick person. So we actually have interest from a medical company. So, so you would put the application in your chart for potential future business, and what kind of what type of contract is it? Is it a development contract or is it a production contract? What is the time frame? 
second quarter 2013 and we went as far out as first quarter 2016. What is the estimated value of the contract in thousands of dollars? So the first one here would be $500,000. And of course you can see the various sizes of the contract. Some are small, some are medium, and some are big. And then the probability factor for winning it. You know, what chance do we have of, that we think that we can win that contract. Some of them are low, you know. One of them here is 10%. One of them here, we think it's 95% because we've been told that we're going to win that contract. So once you put the percentages in, you multiply the percentage times the estimated value, and then you come up with a probabilistic dollar value. And I'm, has, has this been taught here? Okay, so nothing new here? Decisions made. All right, so we came up with uh, 6340000 as the probabilistic value. If we can convince the investors, and as you as the investors today, if we can convince you that this is uh, a real number over the next two or three years, then from there we can go on to establishing what you as an investor and what we as GII and PSI consider to be the value of the company. So it's somewhere in this neighborhood. You know, it's not a hundred million, it's not five billion, it's not a hundred thousand. It's somewhere in the neighborhood of a few million dollars. And then from there, it's a negotiation with your investors to determine what they think and what you think the value is, so you can come to some kind of an agreement in terms of uh, having an investor actually investing in the company. Any questions here? All right, so here's, here's some of the areas of which I've already talked about, potential orders. Uh, because the sensor is, is, you know, it's not just one little thing that you're going to buy. It's not like you go out, you buy a camera, you take it home. It's something that's going to be put into the ground. It's going to have uh, uh, transmitters and receivers, and things are going to be scattered over 50, 100, 500 kilometers. So there's a lot of systems engineering that goes to it, into this whole process. Once you've developed the, the, the receivers and transmitters and the actual sensor, then you've got to go out in the field and you've got to bury everything in the ground and you've got to make sure everything is working properly. It's kind of like when you go to a concert and you see the performers on stage and there's all the music, uh, the speakers and all the music system and the lighting system. Somebody's got to set up all that equipment, make sure it works before the performance starts. So that's kind of systems engineering and systems implementation. And of course, there will also be a lot of software involved with the hardware. So that's called a development contract, where you develop all that ahead of time, so that when you're in production, you just go out and do it. So the development contracts can be very lucrative, a lot of money involved, a lot of time involved, uh, and a lot of development of the hardware prior to actually going into production. Okay, Armenia's technology is the source for Republic of Armenia's prosperity. Now, it is conceivable that if, if uh, we're successful in winning these contracts that we envision, and moving out from security systems into other industries, such as medical equipment industry, or, or the auto industry, or the aircraft industry, this sensor can be used in a variety of industries. And it's possible that this could become a uh, hundreds of millions of dollars per year company. And it'll be based here in Yerevan. And that will change Armenia. If, if this company could grow to where it was bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars in business to Armenia, that would change the face of Armenia. That would have a huge impact on the economy. So. Here we're talking about just how big is the market out there? How big could this company grow? How big is the market out there? So we just took the, just Homeland Security, forget about anything else in America, forget about the rest of the world, just take Homeland Security, U.S. Homeland Security, how much did they spend uh, in, the, in the last five years for border security? Six, six percent went to border security. 
if one tenth of that six percent went to sensors, or one hundredth of it went to sensors, you're still talking about hundreds of millions of dollars just for U.S. homeland security. So the 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 market for this technology in security systems, the market for it for aircraft and automobile industry, medical equipment industry, it's, it's, it could be huge. All right, so once again, why are we here? Uh, we're looking for investment dollars. We want to complete the qualification of the security system. What, what that means is take it from being a prototype field tested hardware, redesign it, do the environmental tests, prove that it will work out in the field. That's what we're looking for, the development dollars to do that. We want to be able at that point to negotiate with our customers for actual field, uh, field demonstrations and actual production with the customer. So I've already talked about these, uh, private investment, we can meet the objectives of the burning platform. Remember the burn, two burning platforms, one was to protect the Armenian border with Azerbaijan, and the second was to uh, protect the U.S. border with Mexico. Those are the two key things right now, that's the very beginning. And then of course we want to realize the mentioned benefits to Armenia in terms of improving the uh, economic condition here in Armenia by having a big successful company in the future. Here's a timeline. When you're talking to your investors and you want to you want to at least show them what you, what your plans are at least for the first year. So here's a timeline, not real detailed. The investors don't want to know the real all the details, but they want to get a feeling for what's actually happening in your company and where you want to be in the next 12 months. So we laid out a 12-month schedule, and we talked about the things that we wanted to do. And of course, I've discussed these uh, already. Now, having production here in Armenia, because you are, as I said earlier, you're all investors with $10 million sitting in the bank, and you each want to listen to investors and decide whether you want to invest or not. So, because you're Armenian, we wanted to slant this for the Armenian market, or the Armenian investors, and tell you why this is a benefit to uh, investing here. Obviously, you're all wealthy, you all have $10 million in the bank, you all want to be investors of companies, you're looking to make investments. Anybody who's wealthy, the best way to make more money is to invest in things that are going to be successful, and, and those things generate income. And as income is generated within the country, more and more people start becoming middle class and rising up from being poor, going rising into the middle class. And the more you have, the stronger middle class you have, the better it is overall for everyone in the country. So what we're saying is that by increasing employment opportunities in Armenia, we can help everybody in Armenia because the whole economic condition will improve. We also want to uh, maintain the intellectual capacity here in the country. You know, many Armenians have left because of the poor economic situation in the country. But if you have companies that are successful and making sales, selling products internationally, bringing money into the country, then the the desire to leave the country is reduced because people here have more chances to get better jobs and there's a better economic condition. We want to transition Army into a country that exports high technology products worldwide. Now I've talked a lot about that to various high instances here and usually people laugh and you know, they, they, don't, they don't see that happening. And my response is Look what happened to Taiwan. Look what happened to Japan. Look what happened to Germany. And, you know, after World War II, Germany and Japan were totally destroyed. And yet, look what happened. In 30 years, those countries that were totally destroyed came back, and they have big populations. You know, Japan has 127 million people. Germany has 80 million people. 
even with those big populations, they were able to change the country and come from a completely destroyed economy. You know, the Japanese and the Germans in 1946 were starving because everything had been destroyed. The whole road network, bridges, their whole system, their whole economy had been destroyed by bombs. And yet they came back, they built their uh, industries back up, and now they're highly, they're very wealthy in uh, highly respected countries in terms of manufacturing, developing products, high technology. All right, then we have smaller countries that have died. South Korea was destroyed in their war between South and North Korea, and they've come back and become a wealthy country. All right, and then their, their population is uh, less. It's in the 30, 35 million range. All right, let's talk about another country that's even smaller, Singapore. Singapore is a very wealthy country, and they only have 8 million people. So I'm thinking, if those countries with many, many times more people in Armenia can come back and with high technology become wealthy, strong, uh, highly respected countries, why can't Armenia? There's less than 3 million people here. Why can't we do it? And it seems to me it ought to be pretty easy. Now, if you're talking about uh, developing a technology that requires huge amounts of resources that have to be brought in from different countries, yeah, that's a problem because the, the borders are closed. But these sensors are small. The whole thing is the size of my fist. So that's something where it's not a matter of bringing in huge amounts of resources or, or um, uh, unfinished products to bring in to build something. It's something that everything is here now, or it's something that can be easily imported. So as a result, we can do this here. And so we're looking for investors to help us move forward and transition Armenia's economy into a, an exporting of high technology products worldwide. And I think that's it. This was Sandel Gevorgan. I took this photo a year and a half ago. This was the third generation of the hardware. It's smaller now, and of course it won't be in a stainless steel container. Um, but that, that's in its, in its finished form 18 months ago. This is what it looked like. And we made a point of putting Made in Armenia uh, on, the, on, the, on the outside of the hardware. So that's it. Thank you. Question? Am I going to get any investors? <laughs> Is it possible to invest not with the money, but instead uh, of doing some work? Maybe to write the software or something like that? Uh, yeah, now remember, I was talking to you about being an investment, an investor uh, in a theoretical sense, that, you were, that you're sitting here as multi-millionaires investing. And I think you're asking me in a real sense, right? Yeah, as the company grows, we will be looking for people uh, in terms of software and hardware. That, that'll happen. It'll also be in terms of business people. So, uh, and, and coming here to AUA will probably be one of the... I, I, to me, the, the best presentation I could give you is to come here and instead of giving you a presentation, having it be a job fair. And, and say, hey, we've got 50 positions and we're looking for the right people. That, to me, would be the ultimate in coming here and giving a presentation. We're not there yet, but we hope to be. Um, so we're moving forward. So, what I, so the answer is yes, but not now. We're, we're not ready yet. All right, any, any, uh, what I want to do is get your feedback in terms of this as a presentation for an investor. Remember, you're an investor. What did you think of the presentation? Is this something that would have made you interested as an investor to want to invest? Ask some questions. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, about uh, these uh, devices, uh, are they constructed in Armenia or this work is outsourced? Yeah. No, the, the work, everything right now is done in Armenia. Now, we obviously we don't, Armenia does not make electronic components like a capacitor or an inductor or a resistor. So those are those are bought probably from China. But all the assembly will be done here. And it's done here now. Now a lot of key components there are some proprietary issues with this hardware. 
And all that's done here, including making the hardware. Okay, and uh, one other question. You said that it is good for sensing the people, for example. But I think that the um, only uh, advantage of this system is only sensing the tunnels. Since for other uh, issues we have uh, rad radio waves, if I am not mistaken, there are some uh, systems that are uh, uh, sensing people by radio waves. Or we can do it by video cameras. For example, why to make this kind of... Uh, what is the advantage of using this but not using video camera? Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Do the same. No, for did, example, did, did everybody hear that? What is the advantage of using the, this sensor system as opposed to using a thermal imaging camera, a video camera, or radio waves? One advantage of using camera is if you are not there, you can then uh, see who was there. Uh, for example, for uh, my home, I can uh, take the E and use it, for example, to find the person who was there. Right. But it's okay. Okay, uh, all right, so let's go through it step by step. If it's a video camera, it's blind at night, and it's blind if it's foggy. So video cameras are out. Are they going to have it at the border? Yes, they'll have them at the border. Of course they will. What about night vision? You said video camera. Uh, net is step but, uh, by step, I'll, I'll address There is all. also a limit of distance uh, when you use uh, video yeah, camera, it but it, 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 it's the most here we have also a limit of... Okay, I'm gonna, let me address those one by one. You made a good point. A video camera cannot see at night, can't see in fog, and it's line of sight. So if you've got a forest, can't see into the forest. All right? will, will a border security system have video cameras? Absolutely, because when it is daylight, when there is no fog, and if there is no forest, Having a video camera is good, but it doesn't do everything. So you can't just have a video camera. All right, next one would be thermal imaging camera. Thermal imaging camera, I've worked on that in military equipment, so I'm very intimately familiar with video camera, with thermal imaging cameras. Thermal imaging camera is very good for night vision, but it gives you a, basically, it's a, it's a, a gray image. You can't see any color. It's just gray. And it's line of sight. Uh, if the forest is deep enough, it can't see all the way through the forest. It can see, it'll see partially, but it can't see all the way through the forest. But it's line of sight, basically. So if you're behind a rock, or if you're behind a hill, it's useless. All right, well, so we got, oh, and then radio waves. The same thing. If, if it's not line of sight, it's useless. But, but this sensor system, senses everything. It could be, it, there could be a lake there, there could be a forest, there could be a mountain, it doesn't matter. It senses through everything. But the fog matters. Fog? Yes, just kidding. Okay. <laughs> Alright, now, uh, let's address the distance. Right now we're looking at 300 meters out, but remember that's for footsteps. If, if Azerbaijan the Zeri army decides they're going to attack, the first thing they're going to send is not the soldiers on foot. The first thing they're going to send in an attack is tanks. And the tanks, this thing will sense out to 5 to 10 kilometers. 5 to 10 kilometers. So as a result of that, seeing, seeing a tank 10 kilometers away is a huge advantage. It could be behind a mountain, and you're going to know it's coming. You can't do that with other systems. You want those other systems because they each have value. But, but all those other systems can't do with this one. If we're just talking about security systems on a border. Now, you're talking about in your home or your neighborhood. Uh, we actually have a real estate developer who is interested in protecting the perimeter of his development. So if somebody had a 500 hectare development of maybe a golf course and homes and different things like that. You put the security system around the perimeter of that to keep intruders out. You wouldn't necessarily have it for an individual home, although we've discussed that and there is interest in having the security system for individual homes. I think that'll be a little bit into the future, but 
it's possible to do that. Okay, any other investors? <laughs> I'm also going to invest in all <laughs> Maybe not $10 million. But well, what kind of threat do you see from China? Let's say they, they, they have a copy of your sensor, they start producing it, and they do not honor the intellectual property rights, etc. Et okay, intellectual property rights. We've, we've thought about that a lot, and here's the, here's the answer to that. Number one is, if you patent it, and of course I gave the presentation on patents and intellectual property a few months ago, if you patent it, basically when you patent something, you have to write all the details of what your invention is. So you're telling the whole world, this is how my invention works. And then you get a patent. Okay, well, does that protect you? All that does is it gives you the right for whatever country you have to patent in. So if we had a patent in the United States for this technology, then it gives us the right to sue somebody, take them to court, and try to win in court, which in itself is a big, long legal battle, to win and prove to the government of the United States that they infringed on our patent. Okay, so then you win, all right, and you get some money out of it. Uh, you, could lose, you could lose your battle in court, in which case everybody knows and can copy your technology. Uh, and it's only good for the country that you got the patent in. So if you got the patent in the United States, but China is stealing and copying it, it doesn't, the patent in the United States doesn't help for China. It's called a trade secret. Okay. So you just try to keep it a secret. Then you go, okay, but somebody can come along and open up your hardware and reverse engineer it, right? You're familiar with reverse engineering. <clears throat> That's possible, except that there's about three good reasons why we think that won't happen with our hardware. One is the technology is extremely difficult to understand. The heart of the sensor is not easy. I don't even know all of it. And I'm a degree physicist and engineer. Uh, and, and we know that there are there's four different technologies in there that have pushed the state of the art. So now you've got to have experts in four different technical fields. That in itself makes it difficult to reverse engineer. But okay, let's say you did that. You've got four experts in four different fields, assuming you knew what the, which four fields they were. So you've got four experts in the right four fields, and they're going to reverse engineer. Well, then what you do is you make it so that when they try to open it up, it self-destructs. And this is pretty common for U.S. military equipment. It's the equipment that is really top secret, if the United States military is worried about the enemy getting a hold of it, they make the part that is they consider top secret, they make it so that if somebody opens it up, it's self-destruct. So even if you try to do that, you just end up destroying it, you can't figure out what it is. Uh, they can uh, give some hush money uh, to the developers. You're right. I mean, it's just a matter of how much effort somebody wants to put in. It's like a bank vault. You know, a bank has a lot of money in their vault. And they go, uh, your money is safe. You put your money in the bank, why do you put it there? Because you think it's safe. Somebody can come along and say, look, if I bring 100 kilos of high explosive, I'm going to blow up that bank vault. I mean, it's just a matter of how much effort somebody wants to put in it. Every good high technology company anywhere in the world will put enough money into research and development where they're always coming out with a better product. So if you're moving far, fast enough into the future with new products, the people that are trying to reverse engineer are always two, three, five years behind. They're never going to be able to reverse engineer as soon as you figure it out the new technology, the latest technology. So you've got to stay ahead of them. So we intend to do that as part of our protection of our hardware, along with self-destruction of the hardware in the event that somebody tries to open it, and the fact that it's already a highly complex 
combination of four different technologies. All right, but you haven't told me whether you'd like, is this presentation something you, each of you has $10 million in the bank and you want to be an investor, is this something you want to invest in? Maybe. Okay, why, why maybe? Why not yes, why, why not no? What, what's preventing you from, tell me what's preventing you from wanting to invest. I will not think uh, your measures of 10 times better was not safe, uh, what is measured, exactly. And uh, there is no example of with, uh, which uh, kind of devices you are competing, and for example, advantages of this device and that device. Is that example? It's like... Okay, no, that's good. Okay. Uh, we, we have all that information. I didn't want to bring it today, but that's good that you brought that up. His point is that if you're, if you're going to compare to your competitors, we want to have a lot of information as to what makes yours better than theirs. More proof, more information showing that yours is 10 times better. Good. And, and you're right. Okay? The thing that it will be good for Armenia as well is it's just making a motivation to invest just for Armenia. But I don't know. Well, I didn't want it to be, uh, I didn't, we don't intend for it to be you're just investing in Armenia just because it's an Armenian technology. Oh. What I'm saying is that this technology is world-class technology. You're investing in it because we think it's a good world-class technology, <coughs> but the fact that it'll be built here in Armenia and the company will be here in Armenia, providing jobs here in Armenia, is we were hoping to be an additional motivating factor for Armenian investors. That's, that's, <laughs> that's my meantime, point of view. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. In the meantime, it's uh, demand, uh, demand rate uh, isn't uh, too high, isn't it? Uh, for hours or for, for sensors in general or for hours? Yeah, uh, you're right. Right now we don't have sales. Uh, part of it is because we're a new company, and it's, it's, you know you got to get the word out worldwide, and that in itself takes time and money. The second issue that, and this is not just with us, this is with any new technology. If your technology is so much better than the current technology, nobody believes it. So we're finding out that when we tell different companies and different governments that our technology is 10 times better than what's currently available? The first response is, we don't believe you. Then we give them test data, and they don't believe the test data. And then we tell them to come out in the field with us when we're out in the field testing, and, and we haven't gotten anybody that's willing to do that yet. So there's a lot of resistance to new technology. This is not just for this technology. It's always, it's always like this, it's been like this, and it will always be like this in the future. It's not new, it's something you just have to plan on overcoming. Any other comments, issues, investors? Okay, well there's no more than that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.